So um, what I'm going to tell you about today is a kind of a story um, about a kind of where my passion really lies. Um, we're, we're actually in my laboratory, and I just walked across, and I, I normally don't dress like this because I work in the lab with lots of chemicals, and, uh, but I want to tell you about what we want to do with these spiders and what we see we can do with them as far as their spider silk goes. So we actually see spider silk as a, a potential next generation biomaterial. And we see it as a next generation biomaterial because it's got incredible diversity. And I'm going to walk you through and show you just how incredible um, spiders are. And I hope by the time that, that I finish that you'll have a new perspective on spiders and instead of maybe squashing them with your foot, which so many people like to do, you'll look at them and uh, see them from a different light. So spider, spider silk is one thing a lot of people don't realize is that it's an incredible material. It's a high performance material that outcompetes high tensile steel. And when you see silk, you don't necessarily come to that conclusion. So with spiders, over 40,000 different species have been identified, and most spiders spin silk. Modern spiders, which are spiders that you would encounter um, in your world today, spin, as far as we know, at least six to seven different fiber types that have different mechanical properties. So when you look at a web, it's not just one thread, one material with one set of mechanical properties. It's actually quite diverse. And spiders have evolved these different threads for different biological functions, which include web construction, wrapping prey, locomotion. And for female spiders, they wrap their eggs and they protect their eggs so that they, during development, survive. So these are, our focus in my lab have been on two spider species. So we have black widow spiders that are in our lab, which are um, on, you can, most people will notice black widow spiders because they're very ca characteristic with the females have the red hourglass on their abdomen. And I, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down here because it'll be easier for me to point out some things as we go along. So do we actually have um, the black widow spider that is here, and you can see the female spider, there's a male. Males do not look like the females, and that might shock you, uh, but the male is in the web. Um, this is, there's actually an egg sac that's positioned here, so this is one particular fiber type. This material is actually different than these threads that are in the actual web. They have different mechanical properties. Over here, this is a, uh, a different spider species. This, this is actually an orb weaver. The spider cast a two-dimensional web, whereas black widow spiders cast a three-dimensional web. Now, the reason why we have these two spider species in our, in our lab um, is because they're easy to raise, and we can keep them alive for periods of time so that we can actually study the properties of the silk. Their abdomens are very large. We've had to do a lot of micro dissections of these spiders to learn how they produce silk What's the process? What's all the plumbing look like to do that? And so those have been two very important um, things. The other thing is that it's hard when I send my students out to collect spiders to bring back the wrong species, especially when I'm asking for a female black widow spider. Uh, so that, that does simpl simplify things a bit. So this is, I'm showing you a picture of the inside of my lab. We actually have a lot of cages. They are square boxes that are made out of plexiglass. Uh, we have lots of black widow spiders in there. We normally keep over 100 in the lab because we're dissecting all the time and we're collecting fibers. We have the cages are actually shown here on the right. So we keep the spiders in there, keep them in there for a couple of years, and we can collect the materials and study the mechanics of the fibers. So what is silk made out of? Big question. A lot of people would want to know that. It's predominantly just made out of protein. And these are very um, large, what are called large molecular weight proteins. And to give you an idea of uh, protein size, in, in the protein world, there's different sizes of proteins. So if I use a comparison, perhaps, of human weight, average human weight being 200 pounds, 
these proteins are on the order of about 1,200 pounds, if you saw a 1,200 pound person in the world. So they're very large proteins which make them uh, difficult to work with in the laboratories, you might guess. If you, we look at the protein sequences themselves, what we find is that they have internal block repeats in their sequences. And any time you find uh, proteins that have internal block repeats, um, they behave much like uh, materials, like polymers, and it makes them very good at being able to use to do um, where you insert them into organisms and you don't end up getting immune system rejections. And so they're, they're really not, the fibers themselves are not really immunogenic. Uh, they're very biocompatible. So we, we see it's already been done in mice where they can put the fibers in and there's not a lot of inflammation, there's not rejection. So we envision in humans for implantation these fibers will work very well. They're also very environmental friendly because they're protein, if they're left out in the environment and they break down, we don't have to worry about toxic uh, material being left. So they really are considered to be a very green material. So what about the mechanical properties? Um, when we compare the mechanical properties of spider silk fibers to really renowned man-made materials, we compare them to high tensile steel, we compare them to Kevlar, which is, which is used for bulletproof vest. And we compare and we look at certain properties, material properties. And for engineers who are material scientists, there's a set of parameters that they look for, for a material. They look at tensile strength. That's, uh, tensile strength is how strong the material is. So but you can pull on it and how, how much energy, how much do you have to apply before it breaks. Um, there's also, in addition to that, there is extensibility. How much can you stretch the material before it fails? And the last parameter that's very important is toughness. How much energy can the material absorb per unit volume before it just completely fails? And so when we actually compare spider silk to, um, to high tensile steel, what we will f we actually see, so here's high tensile steel. This has to do with the strength of the material. It, can, it competes very well with Black Widow major ampullate silk. This is the silk when the spider falls off of its web and it climbs back up. This is that silk type. We, and we look at extensibility, how stretchy it is before the material fails. We see it's 24% extensible. High tensile steel is not very extensible. You know this by experience. Overall, if we can look at the toughness of the material, the spider silk is 25 times tougher relative to high tensile steel. So it outperforms that material. If we look at Kevlar as a comparison, it's used in bulletproof vest or body armor today. It's not quite as strong as Kevlar. It is more extensible and it is three times tougher than, than actual um, Kevlar. Now there's other interesting things that surfaced um, when we were studying silk. Is that spiders, I mentioned earlier that they have, uh, they can spin fibers that have different mechanical properties. So as we started to look at the different fibers and the positions of the web, we noticed there were a broad, there was really a diverse, uh, uh, it was really diverse with respect to the mechanical properties. So here is actually comparing AK silk, which is what the females wrap their eggs in. If we compare the material properties of AK silk to dragline silk or major ampullate silk, we can see the numbers are actually different. This indicates a different material altogether with a different biological function. When we looked at the other silk types, and there's at least five others that we know of, and the mechanical properties are all different. So this is, this is really um, exciting because it suggests we've got a wide range of different materials that can be used um, in engineering, and we can, I can't even begin to describe different applications because we don't really know where all of this will go. But I can tell you that it could replace uh, body armor. Kevlar is extremely expensive to manufacture currently. You could en envision sutures, artificial tendons, ropes, cords, guitar strings for that matter, tires, shoes. They're already using lower concentration of spider silks to deliver drugs in a lot of in vitro systems and scaffolds and films are already being formed. So these materials are already being used and 
it's just they're going to continue to grow and expand as we try to figure out which silk type from the spider is best for manufacturing. So how are we going to get the material? A lot of people say, well, let's buy a plot of land and put a bunch of spiders on there and go out and melt the spiders. We can go out, we can collect the material, and then we'll be able to use it. There are a few flaws with that kind of idea. Spiders, first of all, are cannibalistic, so they're going to eat each other, and they don't even have to be that, that hungry, and they're going to do this. They're venomous, that's kind of, yeah, I don't know if you want a black widow spider farm, and the juveniles are so small you wouldn't be able to keep track of them all. So that's in the, the spigots, it's not, it wouldn't like, to milk these things, forget it. It's, it wouldn't happen. They're so small uh, as far as the spigot size goes. So our, we're going to take a, we're trying a different approach. We recognize that there are those challenges or barriers. So we have focused on trying to come up with processes, in vitro processes, in the laboratory to spin these fibers. In order to do this, we've spent years um, trying to isolate the genetic blueprints that, that actually contain the information to build these proteins, these silk proteins that we need. We've also studied the the, how spiders produce silk and extrude it through their silk glands. And that has been, that is fundamental for us being able to accomplish our task. So what I show you here is, it's, we've taken a spider, it's in the right hand corner and we've actually, this is an orb weaver, and we've, we've sliced open her abdomen and we are, this diagram is showing the seven silk producing glands. She actually has seven. And we've spent years digging around looking at this. It's really microsurgery. Uh, and it, we've got some of the best dissectors that have come through my lab that, that have phenomenal skills. And so we see things that a lot of other labs don't see. And I'm only going to talk about one of the particular glands today, the, what's called the major amplate gland. This is the gland that actually produces dragline silk. It's got a lot of attention. And we, this, we've taken it out of the spider. It's right in the middle of the screen. So here it is in the middle. And, and I want to describe the parts, the things that we understand about it now, because we have to mimic these parts. So we have this tail region. See this long kind of tubular area? This particular area is, we know it produces the silk protein in large amounts. Its sole purpose is essentially that. The proteins then travel down this tubing, and they, they're stored here in this ampulla region which is more or less a storage vessel to hold the protein in a highly concentrated fashion, 20% weight per volume. That's a lot. It's 200 milligrams per milliliter of protein, which is absurd. And it doesn't crystallize. It doesn't go into a solid. It stays in a liquid form. It's then pushed out through this, this amp ampulla down this tube that narrows, where the material, the proteins, experience chemical changes as well as physical changes. So there's salt changes, there's pH changes, there's shear force that's on the material to allow for the molecules to align, and all of this is happening in the spider on the, on the, as the protein is on its way out. And it goes from a liquid into a solid. So how are you gonna, how, how will we reproduce this? So we're, we're taking different strategies so we're taking our spider silk genes that we spent years to get, and we're putting those genes into bacteria, into yeast, and we're making them make the proteins for us. And they're very good at this, and they can make large amounts. We then can break those cells open, and we have to purify the protein, because the bacteria have other proteins. So we purify these proteins. We try to do it as fast and as cheap as possible so that we get a highly purified sample, because that's what the spider does. And then we take the material, and we have to concentrate it. And we have to achieve the same concentration that the spider does in the ampulla. After we, after we do that, we have to mimic the spinning duct and what goes on when the liquid goes out. So we take the concentrated liquid, and we put it into a glass syringe that has a needle with a very small diameter on it. And very important in the process, what the spider does during extrusion is she then reabsorbs and pulls out a lot of water molecules. She's got to dehydrate the, the material. So we, 
to do that, we'll actually have to be able to, to uh, come up with a process to do that as well. One thing that people don't even realize, but if you watch spiders closely, you'll see it. After they spin the material, they yank on it. So the, the material comes out, they pull on it with their back legs, and that enhances the mechanical properties tremendously. The tensile strength and extensibility. You ask, how does she know how to do that? I don't know. But it does prove, it, it produces a material that is far superior. So we have to mimic that. So we built a homemade device in the lab, so that once we spin synthetic fibers, we can actually simulate that. We can pull on the material and, in, and introduce what's known as a post-spin draw. We then have to run back and test the fibers to see how the synthetic fibers we're making compared to natural fibers. Are we there? Are we producing this material that's that, that's that good? Here's our picture of our spinning apparatus in the lab. We have a syringe pump here. You can see the actual syringe with the needle there. This is an alcohol bath that simulates the dehydration. We put one drop of fluid in there, and we push it through this, the, the actual syringe, and we can get nine feet of thread from a raindrop, volume of a raindrop. And you can see it coming out. Can you see that we took this video so that I could demonstrate? You can see the, fi the fiber coming out. It's being pushed through the needle at this particular point. We then will actually take this material and do what the spider does. We introduce a, a post-spin draw on the material. And the post-spin draw is done by spooling the, we spool the thread onto a caliper that has two combs on it. You can actually see the thread here spun, that's, that's kind of spooled around it. We hot glue the ends down so the fibers won't, won't move on the outside. And then we submerge this into an isopropanol bath to dehydrate the fibers and we can stretch the fibers up to six times their original length. You can see when we're doing this, because we're trying different ratios, some of the fibers fail, but I can tell you the mechanical properties are improved tremendously by doing this. So our lab is, we, we've been able to, this shows, we've been able to, to pull them to their, past their original length, four and a half times here. We've taken some fibers up to six times. So what do the fibers look like? How do they compare to the natural fibers? So we have instrumentation to be able to take our spun fibers and run back using a scanning electron microscope to actually look at the morphology, the alter structure. And our relative to natural silk, which is shown on the left, and we have our synthetic silks shown on the right, they look very similar. If we break the, our fibers, our synthetic fibers, and look at the interior to see how the packing's going on, because that affects mechanical performance, we see very good packing. So where are we? How close are we to the natural fibers? Well, this is, uh, we've collected data uh, very recently on some of our spun fibers, and we've been making actually synthetic egg case silk fibers in the lab. So I have two different kind of, um, two different fibers that we've spun, and they experienced po different post uh, spin draw ratios, and we actually can see these are the actual tensile strength values, and this is where the natural silk is. So we're about 25% of the way there. You and then if we compare extensibility, our, our values are a little bit lower, our toughness values here are, are low too, but we're getting close. We've come a long way in a year. The spinning process is very difficult. There are so many challenges there. When I put that up, there are so many parameters to change, even though we've been studying her internal um, silk producing glands, we are fiddling with m parameters to see what's optimal. We're going to get there, and you're going to see a new next generation of material. And it might be five years from now, but it's coming. Uh, and it's, it's going to revolutionize engineering. Um, so fasten your seatbelts because we're on, we're on the verge of that. Uh, and uh, there are a few labs that are working on this. Not very many labs because it's so multidisciplinary. There's engineering, there's chemistry, there's biology. And to be able to clone the genes, put them into the other organisms, produce the proteins, purify the proteins, take them and spin them into fibers, do the mechanics, it's a lot. Um, but we're doing that in our little tiny lab across campus. Uh, and so we're well positioned to make big marks, I believe. So without this, you can't make progress unless you have resources. 
Uh, our lab's been funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, we currently have two grants. I've had phenomenal students here at Pacific, undergraduate students, master's students, um, and a lot of collaborators. Um, and so with that, I'll just leave you with the last thought. See the, you see a spider out in the world tomorrow, don't step on it. Bring those animals to my lab because I'll house them for you. <laughs> <laughs>